Working. Loud in here. All right, Linus, welcome to UVU. Thank you so much for Cinna Skyping with us. Uh, what'd you guys think? Give him a. All right. We've got about 20 people here and about 30 people online. So uh, some of the people were watching with us over Zoom. Some of them joined us, but watched it on Netflix on their own time. But uh, such an honor to have you. Uh, it's, um, like I said, uh, a lot of us who are part of the CineSky class have been binging uh, your films, and I know that makes you nervous. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I've got, I'm going to start off, off with a few questions. Let me just, um, let me just uh, mention again to the people at home. If you're at home and you want to ask a question, you just put your name in chat. All I need is your name, preferably both your first and last names. If you're here and you want to ask a question, just come on down here. And, um, and, uh, um, and so people are doing that, so that's great. Um, Linus, so tell us, I know, I know enough about this story and this character in your past, but um, tell us a little bit about this character because I know that this is a character that you that you sort of had been working with in different forms and different formats beforehand. And I also know that people who have studied you know that you have a background of working with special needs kids and that sort of inspired some of your interest in this character. Can you just sort of, especially for those people who just were kind of watching this movie, it's your first, their first experience with you, uh, get into that a little bit? Yeah, well, I actually got my start making movies uh, as a, a babysitter um, for developmentally delayed kids or kids with, you know, learned dis disabilities. I was a nanny in New York for a lot of years working with some very special kids. And um, yeah, and uh, I would just kind of make videos with them, sometimes like working through some trauma. <laughs> I didn't really know it at the time, but like this kid hated being bossed around. So my first film was where he got to be the ba the babysitter and the bad babysitter who was like really yelling at me and I was the kid. So <laughs> kind of got to work through some power dynamics there. And um, yeah, so Shanzi isn't like directly inspired by any of these kids I worked with, but I do have a relative too who has a developmental disability and I kind of, you know, a lot of stories just being around her growing up and um, a little bit inspired by her and um, her sister. It, this is like my um, my sister's husband's family. Um, and yeah, so and just reading about, you know, people who have someone in their family with a intellectual disability and like how hard it is or they're neurodivergent in some way and just how, you know, um, oftentimes it's like sad to kind of not be able to show the full spectrum of their colors, you know, both uh, pleasant and unpleasant. And uh, I was glad that at some of the screenings people picked up on that and appreciated, um, you know, uh, some sort of an honest take but also um or as best as I could do and then uh you know specifically kind of showing this this man's weird kind of dysfunctions Todd the character yeah. and a lot of his guilt having a brother um that he knew wasn't going to have the same life experience as him or the same opportunities uh right so yeah, I mean, I have two brothers, but um, you know, we're being recorded, right? <laughs> yeah, but anytime you want, if you, anything you want to delete, we can. You know? I guess I, I just don't want to throw them under the bus, but you know, um, they're characters, so right. well, I could I channeled some of that for Todd, even though it's a different scenario. Well, and that you know, when one of the interviews I saw with you about this. Um, What's the actor's name who plays Todd? I forgot his name. Uh, Tim Sharp. Yeah, so so I heard that you and Tim pretty much only met a little bit before this. And while watching it, one of my favorite things about this film is the d dynamic between you guys. Um, and it really feels authentic and very, uh, that, that great scene beforehand where, where you just come over to 
uh, where they just come over the very in the very first time and you guys are sitting there and, and talking that feels so genuine and so real and and I think that that it's also real nice to see that brother dynamic um, with these two characters. So how did you how did you without I mean it feels so so genuine what was sort of the processes of, of like building that relationship or did you just dive into it or did you shoot that towards the end I don't know what what happened um we did we I try to shoot it chronologically as much as possible but um not not yeah so but not totally um yeah so that was probably earlier on um yeah and actually the stuff all at the the dad's house was earlier because we had to shoot that location out so Unfortunately, my advice is to not shoot a sex scene on the first or second day. <laughs> um, your actors, whether they're male, female, or non-binary, <laughs> will not really appreciate that. Uh, so um, yeah, because we're still getting to know each other. But anyway, Melanie is like was a trooper. Um, but Todd, uh, Tim, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, um, I'm, I appreciate you picking that out doing um yeah i love that little scene there with them we yeah we kind of just hit it off but um you know um i'm not sure what to say about it but we had someone else in mind for the character and then they got another job so tim was a late addition but he came highly recommended from several people and i'd seen him in some stuff so but yeah um I think that was like late at night, end of the night. I the beginning of the shoot was so crazy. I was doing so much. I was like doing the data transfer stuff too. Um, after acting and directing all day, and like because we didn't quite have someone the first week doing that, and it got all messed up. So I had to like re-download all the cards. And so after the first night of shooting, I stayed up till like three in the morning, protecting all the footage. And I was like, you know a wreck the first few days so we're just totally i was only um running on fumes and love for the for the the, the scene partner the, so. that makes me want to ask a production question and this will be my last question i want to give other people a chance but um i think it was a 15-day shoot I, I think originally uh it was probably more like 18 and then um we did reshoots, so like six months later. Um, well, uh, were those were those reshoots because there's things that didn't work, or you just needed to add things? I think students are interested in that sort of thing because they yeah, there were. I always I always need reshoots. <laughs> so if you don't think you're a good writer or filmmaker, maybe you just work it in. Um, I mean, you can do it on a small level. I. I, I I, I'd like to kind of make it more part of the deal when I make films in the future. Um, but yeah, uh, let me just try to think. Um, the ending didn't quite land. We had new ideas for the ending. We wanted to flesh out some other characters, but the biggest thing we wanted to change was like, we we tried to amp up the stakes and the, the drama when, um, Sean Z, there's the whole miscommunication or misunderstanding about his niece and all that stuff. So um, that was like more of a fight. It was pretty well shot and acted, but then uh, one of the producers suggested that like, it's like almost like the police are there, you know, that kind of thing. That was, that was a pickup type of stuff. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then we added some other things since we were already reshooting you know yeah the gang back together how big yeah. was your crew uh it was about like i don't know 12 or 15 people very very small yeah because this feels like just kind of that that border between micro and low it's kind of that space in between right or maybe between no and micro somewhere in there and so and we yeah. You know you have like bigger actors and and sort of sag rules and things like that and and but it still feels like you're that you're that's part of just your approach to it that uh that you weren't i mean it's a great script for a low budget movie that's one of the things that i'm trying to get at just a few characters a few locations and um i mean is that 
so I guess my question there is, is that, I mean, going in, was that very much part of your, your plan? You were writing for a specific budget or were you having to scale back thinking that you had a, a smaller budget than maybe you hoped for? Or, or can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, I really wrote it uh, sort of naively without thinking of that kind of stuff. And then Jay Duplass, who I had just worked with, um, had seen a draft or two of the script and was so excited that he wanted to produce it. So, um, um, I mean, in in the future, I would I would scale it down. I mean, I, I'm doing that with my film now that I tried to shoot last summer. I think I told you about, but um, it's just too many people. Um, and as I get older, and I realize just how much time there it takes, and like, I want to just be better and have more time and work with the actors. And so it's like, how can you minimize, whenever I'm writing, I do think now, well, or in the rewriting, how can I think um, less setups, less characters, <laughs> just get to it, get to how, yeah. I, I think, think of a film as like a 45 minute, What? how could you tell the story in 45 minutes and then flush it out? I don't know, that's kind of my new motto. Oh. So so it was, I mean, it's a lot of characters in Rainbow Time even, and um, yeah. I mean, if you're gonna make a movie, we shot it. Um, I'm not sure I'm supposed to say this, but I guess it doesn't matter, it's so long ago. We shot it for like $47,000. And then, um, which is crazy. I probably couldn't do that now, especially with COVID protocol yeah. and stuff but but i think just like the prices have gone up anyway um but that's if you're doing it as like a kind of crew movie if you i could also shoot a movie for probably five thousand dollars if it was just me and a few people yeah. you, once i mean jay duplass always says once you think of it as a movie once you have crafty and a truck then you're in trouble then it's a movie yeah, 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 yeah. And, it, and it jumps up like you know, 30 to 60 grand right there. And as soon as you have a truck, you have a trailer and then you have a, yeah, it just escalates so quick for sure. Let's bring in some students. When you guys come up, introduce yourselves, please let them know your name and also uh, what, where you are in school. And can, can I see how many people are there? Can you turn so the- We got, the... We got about 20 in here. In oh, that's cool. Room. Oh. And, and cool. then- and then we have uh, all these other people at home. So, and again, yeah. show yeah. your faces. I mean, as many as you can, can. That's a whole, that's part of the contract here. Come on, man. Hi, Gabby just came on. <laughs> I'm calling people out. Hi, Dwayne. That's not Dwayne. I'm Dwayne. This is. <laughs> oh, sorry. Duh. I was like, oh my God, I'm so tired. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Matthew. I'm a senior in the post-production uh, track, and uh, I wanted to pick your brain about something. So uh, when I was reading uh, the um, end credits, uh, I, I noticed someone was responsible for VHS, VHSing, and that got me thinking. Uh, we see uh, two uh, recording devices in the film, uh, Lindsay's camcorder and then uh, Shanzi's uh, VHS player. And I was wondering, uh, did you... Uh, uh, actually get the data from those two, or do you just record them and then put a, an effect on them? Um, I'm so unprepared for this. Um, I almost can't remember. We've tried it both ways. We projected the VHS tape, shot on HD. Uh, there was like shutter speed issues. Maybe the projector wasn't right. It was like the DP doing all this extra work just to try to make it work we we had basically shot some of that footage too with the regular cameras and so we tried to make that look vhs we kind of had like our all our um scenarios sort of covered um when we were shooting so those scenes took longer because we we're kind of like yeah like vhsing them at a certain point but then we ended up just sticking in the VHS footage that we imported straight into the computer uh, through a little converter thing. We literally just stuck that into the timeline and blew it up. So that's ultimately after trying to all the trying all these technical frustrating ways that 
that's what basically worked best. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have so let's see. I think we have. Let me make sure I don't cheat anyone. Sebastian, go for it. Yo, what's up? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Sweet. All right. Um, I think it's insane that you were able to like. I mean, I, if you haven't heard of the movie, um, like Krisha and like all these other micro budget movies, like um, Primer, it, it's absolutely insane. Like you could make that quality of a movie for like such a low budget. And uh, as the years go by, I think like making feature films are getting much more accessible as the years go by. I mean, you couldn't really make a feature film like the 80s, like by yourself, you know? I mean, you had VHS cameras, but like now you have like a lot more access to things and people and things are getting more accessible. So I guess what I was wondering about Rainbow Time is how you were able to, I guess, market the movie for like a broad audience, this micro budget movie and getting into these big festivals or getting into these regional festivals. I was just, how was like the process of that? Well, um, yeah, I mean, thank you. I think there's a compliment in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll pretend there was. Yeah, there was. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I do feel like it's like a, it's a group of people who can do a movie for that kind of little and wearing different hats and all that. Um, and I guess it's kind of, can't, it makes, like I came up doing documentaries, you know, when I was younger and so. I'm sort of used to doing different things, but um, I mean, really, we had so much help because the Duplass brothers were producing it, you know, mm -hmm. and Melanie Linsky was in it. So um, I'm mean, not to say that it wouldn't get into a, a big festival, but that definitely helped and it, it definitely helped with the distri distribution. So, cause we had this company basically putting money into well I guess we had we paid a PR company too so that's kind of part of the budget that got added on later mm -hmm. um, we ultimately sold it to Netflix so we still made a, a profit but um yeah does that sort of answer your question but I mean other films can generate you know like I think the PR, it's like, it's kind of crazy how much it is, but you know, it's like, you can try to find PR companies and do that work, you know, uh, or yeah. find someone who's cheaper. And it's definitely a whole nother phase of the project uh, of like, you know, if you feel like you've just, you know, making a feature film, it's like running a marathon, you're about to die. Yeah. And, and you're like starting another marathon right away if you kind of do it all on your own. And it's totally possible. Uh, do, yeah. do you have a follow-up though I want to make sure I answer yeah no I, I was just like I, I kind of relate to that because like I feel like whenever you make regardless of whether it's like a short film or like a feature there's like three depression stages that you go through it's like um I would say pre-production is probably like the most happiest it's like dude this is gonna be like the best movie ever and then you go through like the filming process and you're like oh okay it's not like what I was hoping for but you know maybe an editing would help and then you go into editing and it's like great did i just like you know like make the worst movie of all time but then you know you had in sound mixing you had in sound you know yeah and all these other things and the color grading and it's like it's like okay this this movie look looks a little better you know and like i guess um how do you get over um that hurdle because it's so like, because some people i know it's like it's kind of like never ending right so. Yeah, it's never ending. I guess it's really a personal, you have to dig deep down into your soul about why you're doing it. You know, are you doing it to make daddy love you or, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> guilty um, or, you know, um, because you love the process and it's rejuvenating to you. Um, you have to find your own way to make it sustainable on a sort of spiritual level, I think. And it's, very hard. It's probably the hardest question out of, you know, oh, yeah. I'm still kind of not even sure I can keep going, but I'm sort of trying to reinvent myself so that I could um, make another movie. You know, I'm making a weird drama therapy short film this fall just to sort of recalibrate myself and to practice this kind of, I'm studying drama therapy in grad school right now and 
I'm making a, a short film in a way that I hope to do a workshop and lead people making their own kind of therapeutic short films, um, which is kind of a, you know, kind of having to do with my next feature, but kind of not, you know, it's sort of, it mm. was written before the drama therapy stuff. Um, but, you know, I think it's sort of helping me figure out like, what's the essential ingredients for this story? Yeah. Uh, one little last question. This is a little bit more fun. How is it like working with Tobin Bell? Because immediately when I first saw him, I, I, I was like, oh, it's the saw, it's, you know, it's the saw guy. Uh, I was like, um, I guess, um, how are you, how, what was it like working with him? Well, to Tobin was in this movie, Manson Family Vacation that I was in, um, mm -hmm. with, that I was in with Jay Duplass and uh, Tobin was like this bad guy character in it. And, uh, but he was great. He's like kind of an actor's actor. He's really, yeah, uh, loves the process and he's a great actor. And um, we kind of kind of hit it off. So I asked him to be in this. Uh, and he he said he would do it if there was a scene with him and Melanie. <laughs> so <laughs> I wrote us that the hospital scene with them too. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a, a side note. But yeah, he was really fun. He's a great sport. Yeah, he has such a deep voice. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. All right, hand it over here. No, it's good. <laughs> Hi, Dwayne. I'm not Dwayne, sadly. I should change my name, shouldn't I? But my name's Maddie. I don't know what year I am in school. I just go here. Uh, <laughs> I first wanted to thank you um, for telling the story of Shanzi. My brother is special needs as well and is developmentally challenged. So it, it meant a lot to me to see that community represented. And also that relationship between Shanti and his brother, I it made me smile. <laughs> and I saw me and my brother um, in that as well. And some things that Shanti did, I was like, my brother would do that. And he has done that. Um, specifically his outfit. There was times when he would wear sweats and his drawstring from his sweats would hang out. And like my brother has definitely done that. But <laughs> I was curious um, to know your preparation to play Shanzi and your decision to play him yourself and not hire an actor on this on the spectrum where we're developmentally challenged um, and just kind of your experience playing him as a character. Yeah, well, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I'm totally, you know, um, I think it's problematic that I was in the, played the role. <laughs> I wouldn't do it today, but I did it then um, in 2015. Um, so yeah, I mean, I had been working on this character. I sort of was compelled to find the humor and the humanity in this character for years and made little short pieces or, um, you know, even did like performance pieces with him that were very strange, but um, yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, it's sort of like uh, using a lot of imagination, really. Um, but um, I mean, I and I think it really just comes from that that place of uh, or that time where I spent you know so much time with these kids. Uh, I mean, I guess I've always been touched by people who are other, you know, and I think we can all kind of feel a little bit of that and just imagine, oh my God, you know, it makes you feel like so heartbroken and grateful too for the resources that you have. And um, I don't know. So I guess I'm just really moved by people who have those sort of challenges, but um, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I, the, the reason I guess I played him was partially because I was like working on it, you know, working on the character. And I've done like acting, directing stuff in the past. Uh, and I barely know how to make movies. And I, I, I'm, I, this movie I was trying to make in a particular way in sort of Hollywood, even though it was like in friends' living rooms, essentially. So I just couldn't even wrap my head around trying to find someone 
um, who had some of those real challenges to play Shanzi. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I wouldn't do that again. You know, in the future, I hope to make all kinds of films using that are less autobiographical, um, even though this really isn't as much as my other work, but to like really make films with people outside of me, you know, outside of my realm and outside of my privilege and kind of work collaboratively. I mean, I, I also, not just from like a representation standpoint, but from an acting standpoint, I mean, I want to make films that are devised with with the, the cast, um, sort of um, I'm inspired by the way Mike Lee makes films. And so I could see changing the process so that I could allow more time and it, there'd be more flexibility and the actors, even if they didn't have as much experience acting on a set, they'd be able to function just as competently, you know, to tell the story. Yeah, I didn't mean it as a dig. I thought you did a great job playing them. <laughs> and you played them like pretty accurately. Like I said, I saw things in my brother in your performance. So you did a fabulous job and thank you. It was a great film. All right, next up is Roan. Hi, Linus, my name's Roan. Uh, I am a senior in the post-production track and this is quite the pleasure. And uh, so, so one thing that I've really been, I found myself struggling with lately is whenever I'm writing or storyboarding a scene that takes place mostly in a car, I'm kind of having a tough time being able to utilize the limited space and make them interesting, both kind of visually and maybe even necessarily narratively. And watching the ride, I mean, with that taking place with probably 80%, if not more in a car, and also with seeing how you have a lot of scenes in the car, in Bass Ackwards. I'm really interested in what your approach is to pre-visualizing scenes in cars and even how that might change when you're on set and how, how you set that up. Yeah, um, cars are tricky, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks for watching the ride. Um, I'm not sure everyone had access to that, but yeah. Um, I loved it. I thought it was so funny and really touching. Thank you, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, I, I don't love the way it looks in that. We have, just because it was such a low budget, quick thing, we shot in like four or six days with the pickups. Um, we just mounted them on the dashboard, but I'm a big fan of like mounting the car outside the window or on the hood. Um, I've rarely done that uh, as a director, but um, Bass Ackwards, I mean, uh, oh, and on Rainbow Time, it's funny, we tried to do a mount on the car to shoot the scene with um, Todd and Lindsay, and we wasted all morning, and it didn't work, and we got half the scene by the time it was dark out, we couldn't finish the scene, so yeah, um, if that happened again, I'd be watching the clock and saying like, nope, get in the back seat. <laughs> hold it up and kind of like how we did it which I'm not like always the big fan of, biggest fan of especially in rainbow time which has less of a a look like bass Ackwards, which is more of a documentary kind of extreme close-up like document bass Ackwards was shot like all on a 50 millimeter just this the one lens the whole time so it was like always just moving everything so that the camera could get it or you know so the profile shots in that are just from the the dp sitting in the front seat being very brave without his seatbelt on um which he should not have done <laughs> but for some reason he couldn't get the angle right um so yeah i mean i i just feel like if you can't if you don't have the 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 tools to make it look really good just like I mean, DPs who are really flexible and just can make anything look good or find a way to be inspired um, and just shoot something, you know, um, you know, usually that works with like documentary filmmaking or something that's like rough or, um, yeah. But just like, you know, don't, like you can use the limitations to your advantage. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, 
Hi there. Uh, name's Donovan. I um, really liked the film, by the way. Um, this one isn't really a question about the film, though. It's more about a view as a director. Um, basically, after watching Mark Duplass's interview from South by Southwest, Mark stated that um, he and his brother saved up um, to make their first feature film, uh, where in Mark's words, he said, turned, to, turned out to be a steaming pile of dog diarrhea, which led them to almost give up on their filmmaking entirely. And so I was wondering if you've ever gone through a process like that and what you did to get through it. Um, no, really, I mean, Rainbow Time was like my biggest film. Um, I mean, it was sort of a bummer that the ride didn't get distributed or anything it was at Sundance like two and a half years ago um but the pandemic happened you know uh um but I I worked really hard on that you know I don't think I was joking on set that it was just a tax write-off for Mark Duplass <laughs> and and then like uh, I was creative enough to get it into Sundance <laughs> so I don't know I mean there's just not a lot of market for um web series but maybe you're kind of speaking to creative heartbreak in general and how you get over that yeah um I mean, every movie is kind of like a heartbreak, you know? I mean, you make Rainbow Time and one person says this, where there's one review like that, and it's enough to quit doing it forever, you know? Every movie you could rationalize quitting over. Um, there's there's kind of a, a cool story. I, I used to do comedy in my early 20s and um, hung out with a lot of cool comedians and um my friend and i would always give um kind of tease our friend eugene merman who's he's on bob's burgers and stuff um but he's a very funny guy but he was just so he had such a great attitude because even when he would bomb we'd say like hey eugene how how, how you doing how'd you like the show but he'd always just say like i think people had fun <laughs> or like he would just have this like great attitude about it um I don't know. I just feel like, um, I don't know. I kind of, just on a personal note, I feel like I need to keep making films to survive. You know, I, I, I battle with severe depression and I know I'm, I'm better. I, I feel happier and strong and creative and more resilient when I'm have a project going. So um, maybe there's some other healing I need to do, but I mean, I just feel like, you know, life is so hard. And if you can squeeze a movie out, even if it's like a small thing that you made, it's such a, a ritual. It's such a concreti concretizing of a part of your life. You know, there's so many movies that I sort of thought about doing, um, you know, or scripts I could have finished, and I could have finished them just as easily as ones I did do, but for some reason, you give up, you know. Um, I don't know. Does that help at all? <laughs> yeah, it did. It did. Thank you very much. <laughs> How are you holding up? I'm good. I'm, I'm so appreciating this. I, I was just shooting a scene for my new short film today and now I got this it's like a movie day yeah yeah it makes you feel like a, a real guy makes and me I, feel like a yeah a film person yeah for sure okay Ethan hi there I'm I'm Ethan and I'm uh technically I think I'm a junior I'm like half junior half senior uh, but I'm in the directing track right now and what I thought was really interesting is that you obviously play such like a huge role in this but you also like wrote and directed it. So I'm always curious, like the process goes with juggling these roles between uh, acting in a film and also directing at the same time. Yeah, um, anything specifically, like what do you think is so hard about it or? Um, just like, how do you manage like your work days going through it? Where both, I mean, you mentioned earlier how you were acting all day and then you come back just to help like offload the footage and good and review it and stuff. So I'm just curious, like, how how does that affect you when you're just like going like 24 7 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes I, um, I hope to be a better director one day. I think like when you write a story and you're just like a, a, a nice person and who's conveying and and feeling grateful towards the actors for helping to tell your story, that's probably like half of the job, you know, or it could be the whole job besides dealing with everyone else and getting it shot. Um, but being an actor, you're kind of um, lost up in the waves with the actors, uh, you know? So so in some ways, I don't feel like I've, I've had to direct as much because I'm just an actor doing it with them, you know? So you don't have to be as articulate or verbal with mm -hmm. your process with them. Um, I, yeah. I mean, Honestly, I was a little intimidated by Melanie, um, so I didn't always say thing, you know. Um, if something was wrong, I would speak up, but I was a little too timid, you know. I, I do believe, um, yeah, you want to just, I mean, I, I think it's great. It's better to not act, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, yeah, I'm just curious because, like, there's, in the future, I, I potentially might want to do something similar where, where I act in something that I direct, but I'm always just curious, like, how... Where do you get your feedback from when you're acting in the scene? Like, do you have someone on set in charge of like going over you personally, or is it more just like how you felt you did during the scene, or or how do you how do you work with that? Yeah, um, I mean, I I sort of did. Um, I, I guess I do really do trust Nate Nate Miller, who's the um, the DP on this and the ride. Um, he's just like kind of a quiet guy, but so passionate and dedicated and you can kind of feel him out, you know? I, I mean, I think like the thing about filmmaking and the thing that sucks about writing is you have no feedback, you know, unless you're in school or a writer's group or um, I teach classes and I just know it's so helpful because people get that, you know, like they get to push off of something, they get some reaction, even if it's nonverbal. And on set, I do feel like you want to, I feel like next time I make a movie, I'll work really hard so that everyone knows each other. I'll do like a day or two of just like people doing theater games with each other. Um, like people do not like do not make a movie and where people don't know each other's fucking names. Like just don't do it. It's stupid. Like like you have such this opportunity to help people connect. Like I, well, maybe you're not a great facilitator in that way, but I think everyone can. You don't have to do too much. The more I teach and try to facilitate little improvs and stuff, it's like I'm doing less, you know. I know it's working when people are connecting. So um, I know I would be a better director in just that sense, you know. I'm trying to get people going and connecting. Um, and the crew is important too, besides the actors, because they're the audience. They're the ones like one time I was uh, acting in a scene and because of an injury, I smoked some weed, <laughs> not on this movie. It was in Manson Family Vacation and I was really stoned and I was just like, Davey, the, the crew, they're our audience. They're the we can't do the movie without them. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like this epiphany I hold to this day, like even more so after being in like drama therapy school, like that is they're they're bearing witness to the work in a way that makes it real. Sweet. So, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hey, Linus. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm a third year student at UVU. Um, I just wanted to ask you about your uh, your writing process and specifically how you take things from your life and how you turn that into into a narrative and into a film and how you um yeah convert those those things from your life and get inspiration from that and how that like goes in to your writing process if that makes sense yeah oh uh, I, I um i don't know what you're thinking about specifically but like rainbow time really wasn't i was kind of thinking about what i would say i mean it sort of just kind of came out of me, but using more imagination. Um, Bass Ackwards is obviously more, you know, of a personal story and the ride, if you saw that. But, um, and my next thing is very, even more personal. I mean, I, I had like a, a terrible breakup um, and it's basically a movie about a guy making a movie about the breakup 
with his new girlfriend playing the ex-girlfriend and all the same mistakes happen all over again. So, you know, I mean, the, I didn't make a movie with any new partner, but it's like, you know, it's like directly using kind of that real life history as the backstory for my character. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a, I mean, in that example, it's like a what if, like that whole movie came because I was dating someone, the first person after this very big breakup that like almost killed me like five or six years ago. And then, um, and I was like dating this person and it wasn't going well. I was like too needy and pushing her away and she was being mean and, or whatever, in my opinion. And then I was like, oh my God, we should make a film together. I should like, <laughs> I almost had that thought and I'm like, oh no, that's terrible. And I was with my friend, Jay Davis, who wrote Manson Family Vacation. And he was like, no, but you should make a movie about a guy trying to make a movie in a similar scenario. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, like a, a what if it's like, I mean, um, you want to make movies about how, uh, about how real life makes you feel, not necessarily about real life. So autobiographical movies can be about anything, really, if it's, it could be about a dream, that's part of your, your consciousness. So it's autobiographical. Um, but I do feel like I do really recommend people sometimes people go through an experience and then they don't really want to write about it. This is the biggest hang up with autobiographical filmmaking. You write an experience, you, you live an experience, you don't want to write about it because it's, if it's not triggering anymore, it's just kind of unpleasant or you went through it. So you have to, um, I mean, you don't have to, but, um, what a great opportunity to not reimagine how you know someone hurt you, but to imagine some other outcome or imagine you know some what if uh, at least in the second half. You know, I mean, it's like I think as creative people, we want to be imaginative about our storytelling and imaginative about your own real life um, and what what your future self could do, you know? Awesome, thank you. All right, we got Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel. I am kind of senior, junior um, post-production student. And I kind of wanted to piggyback on some of the questions. I think Ethan kind of stole mine. He like read my mind, but I wanted to ask you because of your different roles, like the writer, director, and actor, and like the process about it. I wanted to ask you about the process on set, like while you're acting, do you like say cut after your line and then you guys watch the take and then you go again and do it? Or like, how does that process go? And then my other one was just how do you run with an idea? Like, how do you know if it's a good one that you want to go for? Or if you're just like, I'm just going to toss that. Hmm. Um, I, yeah, great questions. Um, so uh, on, on Rainbow Time, I like, I was like, should I stay in character? Should I break character? <laughs> you know, and it would kind of help because the voice was different. And Melanie said like, oh, working with Mark Duplass on like, sometimes if he was act on their show togetherness, acting in a scene with her, but then started direct and he has the same voice. So like, I would kind of drop out a character to be a director and that was kind of helpful. Um, but I think it's pretty, conf it can be pretty confusing for the co- you know the other actors um there's hardly ever i i i mean it'd be awesome if you had time to watch stuff but we didn't i thought we would do that and by the second or third day we abandoned it so you're just sort of it's stressful if you don't have someone you trust and um i probably wouldn't do it with like without someone who's like a really close assistant director it's partially why I haven't made this other movie that I'm going to act in again. And I really hope it's the last thing I act in for a while that I direct. But um, uh, the other question about, oh, an idea. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, there's all those screenwriting memes online and like Steven Spielberg said, there's no good ideas or, you know, you just kind of hammer away at it till it's good. I mean, sometimes like the, the art is making a bad idea into something good or that's that's sort of the concept behind it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess using the lens of ideas is sort of part of the problem possibly, possibly because movies are such an emotional medium. So, you know, I, I mean, I always tell my students, you can't, I know you might want to outline the whole movie, but you have to feel your way through it, you know, and you're going to go down some wrong paths. So the, your mind can't help you in your life if you only use the mind. As Ram Dass says, it's a, it's a, you know, wonderful servant, but a terrible master. It's a, it's a tool, but, um, you know, I guess try to trust your heart about like telling a movie that really means something to you. So if like it has those themes, you know, you can dress it up and put any concept on top of those themes, but like, or you don't even need a great concept if it's coming from the heart, you know? <laughs> yeah, I really like that. Have you ever done something that you had like your heart set on and then like while you're going for it, you're like, maybe not yeah i mean i've been scared and i chicken out i don't think i was as wise as i am now <laughs> i say that humbly <laughs> you know it's been a long time um but um where i chicken where where i just i had my heart set on a, an idea and then i like what's the question what happened like if you're you're in the process of making it and then you're like, actually, I don't think this is going where it should be or where I want it to be going. I kind of want to give up. And then you give up. Have you that, has that ever happened? Um, I've never like fully abandoned the film. There's been lots of scripts, but like it's often if it's too clever or something. Uh, I mean, I mean, people try to be authentic, right? They're trying to tell us something new. Um, and some that's why they never write anything because they're like ah no one wants to see that like um with the riot i really on purpose i was like okay no i wanted to bring vegan pizza to this girl who's not available i'm gonna put that in there like i don't give a shit let's try to make this good like that's that's what i talk about with my friends so let's put it in here and try to make it you know help with the story um so like um I do feel like if you're following your heart and, um, you know, um, and using creativity, you can't go wrong. I mean, that sounds overly simplistic. It almost sounds like a dumb thing David Lynch would say, <laughs> you know, like one of his simple, here's how you make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, I think whenever I've gone, like um if you want to be authentic or if you want to tell something new just tell something authentic and it will seem like it's new um so i think if it's really authentic that doesn't mean that it's just pulled from the the headlines of your life either but it could in involve a lot of that mm -hmm. oh that's really yeah i really like that thank you Hi, uh, I'm Cassie. I'm a writer, so that my question involves writing again. So um, I was wondering um, how your approach to writing something like The Ride, the, which is more episodic and shorter, differs to your feature length -like films, especially keeping in mind like the lower budgets. Hmm. Well, I mean, I wrote that just because someone asked me you know, Jay was like, hey, we're doing some web series. Um, and I was really lift driving. So he said, will you write a, a, a movie about a sad lift driver? Because <laughs> he knew I hated doing it. Um, so, I mean, I, th I think it's kind of inspiring now. I didn't really see, I want to like try to inspire people to make films of any length, you know, if you have an idea, I mean, 90 minutes is just so arbitrary. It's like, based off of economics and capitalism, you know, <laughs> who's to say that three act structure needs 90 minutes, I don't know, you know, or more. But um, so 
uh, but I do like, you know, um, feature film writing and, and structure because it seems in general, maybe not because of the length, but um, it seems like a good format for like someone really trying to figure it out. Like you're catching someone at the exact moment usually where they're gonna they're if if our lives are like where we're caught in these little patterns you know from trauma or intergenerational issues or whatever you know you know issues with your parents or whatever you know it seems like a movie is set up to to catch the character at this point where that pattern has almost exhausted itself that belief system that they're living and then so therefore they kind of like and then something really bad happens to them that will hopefully shake them out of this and will inspire them to do something new. And um, that's like the basic way I kind of think about the, the, the heart of the structure of a feature. So I do like that, but also, you know, I'm happy for people to tell stories where people don't change or they change a little bit. And so other, you know, like a web series or a TV show is great for that. Um, they still have hints of that kind of, oh, this might be the thing. This might be the real bottom for this character or the catharsis that leads to an insight for something different, you know? Yeah. Does that sort of sum it up? Yeah, I love that. Thank you. All right, now we have Daxon. This is uh, so meaty. I appreciate, <laughs> yeah, I really yeah. appreciate all these people who just like movies so much enough to do this. Yeah, they're, really, they're really mining your soul. Daxon, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm right here. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for, you know, spending like uh, this time with us and like, you know, giving us like access to like see the ride because I watched that. I really enjoyed that. I, you know, love Rainbow Time and Bass Ackward. So like, you know, thank you. Those are all those are all great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And my big question for you was, so obviously it seems like you pull a lot of like your ideas kind of from like your very real life. Like that's, do you have any specific like cinematic inspirations and cornerstones? Like when it comes to your own movies, like are there any movies that really inspire you? Um, I mean, I, I started making movies because of Werner Herzog uh, and John Cassavetes. <laughs> um, and a little bit did watching David Lynch films when I was younger, but um, when I started trying to make movies, my first movie was called Walking to Werner, which is inspired by Werner Herzog and I walked a long distance. So it's a personal journey film. Um, but uh, yeah, so, I mean, I'm not a big guy about like style. I mean, I, I the way Bass Ackwards looks, I wish I could make all my movies look, I will say that. So look like- gorgeous. Yeah, um, a lot due to just the um, the DP who's just incredible and like a big DP now in Hollywood. But, um, you know, uh, we had a really great connection though. So yeah, I, I hope to make my future films look a little bit more like that. And I just envision them going forward. But um, I don't know. I mean, I love, my biggest influence now is Mike Lee as far as filmmakers and then, um, but he also kind of says like he's he's more inspired by real life and I, I do feel like to you know I mean I'm a little kind of self-centered with my storytelling but I, I see that running running its course at a certain point and making more collaborative films as I mentioned um, working with actors and and creating characters and backstories for characters that feel like they're real and then you're just sort of pushing them into these scenarios and working more like a drama uh, from a dramaturgical lens, uh, less of a writer or, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, Mike Lee's movies are like really locked off and I'm making this movie, <laughs> this short film now, um, but I'm just shooting it myself. So I'm just like locking the camera off. <laughs> and today I really, <laughs> I, I almost screwed up a whole scene because I got, couldn't get the eye line right because I shot it in this weird way where the camera's like so close to me. And then I had my friend shoot this other part of it today. And 
I'm like, well, I guess we'll do a thing where we're almost looking right at the lens. <laughs> so now I'm, gonna, now I'm just going to use that as like a, it's kind of like, oh, that's something like Todd Solons would do. Like he always has the characters like just barely off, uh, um, off from the lens. Um, but um, yeah, I do really like movies that are like like Dallas Buyers Club visually, like a movie like, as far as big movies that are shot like that look like they're on they're not lit and they're you know handheld fifty millimeter. I mean, that's I would if I had yeah I would make everything look like that. <laughs> All right, oh, that's awesome. Uh, I, are, is this short film that you're shooting today? Is this something that's like? purely for school and you or is that something you think you're going to like release at some point i think i might but i'm not really kind of holding myself to it because i'm just trying to like um it's it's sort of about my depression and issues but it's 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 non it's not realistic you know i'm having like uh, a ghost of my ex-girlfriend be a character but it's just you know of a woman you know playing this character and so it's all and then i'm playing my dad and then you know, I'm playing like my nephew and so I'm playing different roles in it. <laughs> it's like totally not realistic. And um, so, which is kind of cool. It's just like yeah. mixing it up this the style. It sounds really awesome actually. Like, I don't know, I, I hope at some point we can see something, we can either see that or, you know, whatever work comes from that. Yeah, well, I'll come back if Dwayne will have me. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. But I, I do really, um, you know, um, think you can use things from your personal life and mine them in very creative ways. Like, like uh, Jonathan Truby wrote this book, Anatomy of Story, and he talks about how like often the main character, if you're looking at it through a, a, a flaw like or a weakness, other characters can have that flaw or weakness. So like some part of yourself you can put into the antagonist, you know. Um, your inner critic. I, I make people like voice their inner critic and then be like, now what character do you think you're going to put that into? You know, so you can dramatize through other characters. Awesome. That's, that, that's actually really helpful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Annie. Um, Hi. Uh, uh, you kind of ruined butterflies for me for a little while. <laughs> no, I love actually that was one of my favorite parts. Um, <laughs> That's a really good line. It's very creepy though. I'm sorry. So good. Um, I really liked the balance of gross and uncomfortable with like heartwarming and gooey. Um, and I was curious if you had any. I mean, because you're like it's like just a little pushing the uncomfortable with the like you know the, the dick being cut off and the I love I love that but was there anything that you felt like you had to cut out or anything that you had to um, that that was just too much along the way um man I'd be hard pressed to to think of something in rainbow time um I mean, all the jokes feel like they're kind of too much, but it's under this sort of device that they're making a film and it's from Shanzi's perspective. Um, I mean, in real life, I think it, it probably would have been good if if Lindsay, the Lindsay character was like kind of censoring it or something, you know, if there was something. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was sort of, yeah. I, I can't really think of anything, but you know, there's there's scenes definitely around like sexuality and women um, that I'd be really even more cautious about now. I guess just being older and just everything we've learned from the Me Too movement and the injustice that women face, and um, I don't know. I guess honestly, I'd just be more cautious about it because I just feel so. You know, I mean, I was just driving home this friend of a friend after a screening at the Mill Valley Film Festival the other night, and I could tell she was just so scared in the car with me or kind of nervous because I'm this strange guy, you know, so it's like, yeah, it's just really different, you know, experience. Um, in the ride, there was a scene where she was, uh, the, there was a sex scene 
in the back of the car and she was like crying about her ex boyfriend or ex-husband at one point and it just seemed like oh this is not this is like kind of off <laughs> you know this is not funny if you see a woman you know so yeah I but I didn't think that like I thought it all very much worked even in 2022 like yeah I don't think you have to be worried about that I think it still works really well because like what you said it's through the lens of Shanzi so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have, I think, so Frazier, are you with us? Frazier, like, didn't write his name, but wrote, how do I ask a question? Right oh, you're Frazier. Yeah. Okay. Was, come on, come on down, Frazier. You're both here and online. Yes. You get extra credit. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? Hi, I'm, I'm good. I'm having a ball. This is fun. Cool, cool. Yeah. So like mentioned, I was online, but then I like ran down here because I was at work and I just got off. But anyways, so I apologize if the question had already been asked while I was gone. Um, but so I'm a freshman and I'm currently working on my first feature film. Um, one of the things that I'm um, that I've surprised myself that I'm most um, excited about is creating and obtaining a budget for my film. Um, but at the same time, it's very daunting because I'm 20 and I don't have that kind of money. So I guess my question is, what advice would you give to first time filmmakers or um, young filmmakers on how to obtain a budget for their first project? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this sort of came up a little bit. We we're talking about Mark and Jay Duplass's trajectory and making uh, a big movie that they saved up for. Uh, I can't remember someone in person was there and asked about heartbreak of some, some, you know, some big film. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, like Werner Herzog would say, there's no excuse, just go out and make your film, especially now there's no reason that you cannot. I, I worked in a factory for five years. Um, you know, it just sounds like an old guy, you know, he's not privileged, but you know, he has some privilege, but um, he's a man. Uh, but you know, I don't know. So I guess I wish I could just say like, don't, don't worry, you know, just, just try to make it without money. Um, you know, but that's, I, I, myself, I couldn't make a movie this past year because I didn't have enough money to do it. <laughs> I, I mean, we're really battling capitalism. We're battling a lot of things when you're making a movie, you know, making any creative endeavor that costs, that can cost so much money. Um, I mean, I do encourage you to watch the early short films of Mark and Jay Duplass. Like they just were so exhilarating and they were made for nothing. So if it's, if it's something just so raw and you cannot can use the the, the crappiness <laughs> factor to your favor, um, you know, or, or find a way to shoot something on weekends or, I mean, it's just really hard. You, you have to like rethink the whole story. Do you have like one friend who's a great actor who will keep showing up every weekend, you know, and keep his hair the same? Like, that's like one way to do it. Um, but I mean, I've never really been good about finding money, so I have no advice. <laughs> I, I asked Andy Duplass for money and he gave me money once. <laughs> Very cool. um, and my future thing, the thing now, um, I'm just, you know, someone might give me money next year in January. And I'll find out. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I did a fundraiser. Um, I have friends who teach classes about doing crowdfunding. Um, but I mean, you gotta try to find a way to make it sustainable. If you do that and it takes you three years and then you, I mean, being a director, it's like, it's kind of being like an athlete who never works out because you're, the director is the person who's on set the least amount of time. So how can you just your creative muscles and do things, whether you're making films or I don't know. Yeah. Di directing like still photographs with your friends or I don't know how can you feel like a director is the bigger question 
Right. Yeah. Well, and I had a second question. Um, so again, I apologize if it was already asked, um, but film is very much an artistic medium. And so I'm also an artist um, by hand. And so looking back at old art, you know, I can see where I've grown and honestly how not very good my old art was. Do you look back at older films at older projects and like see mistakes and go, oh yeah, I, nowadays I would have never made that. Yeah, I mean, I kind of spoke about this just, yeah, I mean, um, I'm trying not to be too insecure <laughs> and crap on my own work, uh, especially with you all, but in general. So it's like any sort of film you make, you're just seeing all the mistakes forever. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, yeah, I mean, to live is to be imperfect, I guess, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much. I think to, I think to live is to give in to the ride. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, that's the la I think that's the last of our questions. Um, so again, really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure uh, deep diving into, into your films. Thanks for sharing some of those links. Um, everyone, give them a round of applause. And everyone at home, thanks for hanging out. And thanks for letting us record this. And, uh, and we'll, we'll see you around. Stay in touch. Well, I just really appreciate it, Dwayne. And um, yeah, it's an ego boost. It's nice to feel like a filmmaker, even without the, the praise aspect. It's like, it's really great to get feedback. I, I guess that's another kind of little words of advice, you know, showing people is, is not just like your insecurity. It's like kind of what makes it, completes the process. Sure. It's a great feeling. Hey, I'm going to send you, I'm stopping recording now, just real quick.